So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 21. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was forever he, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. You know, for Peter's audience, liberation was a key theme. It was a key theology. It was a key idea that they held to, that they had seen and were yet longing for. It was the has been and looking forward to in the future, the now and the not yet, right? Many of our brothers and sisters in Christ all throughout the world in other countries are very familiar with this idea and this theology of liberation. Some, though, still continue to seek it as a political liberation. That's kind of the American way. And so we don't always understand the spiritual liberation being spoken of. Liberation theology and this idea that was being preached here is that liberation is grounded in the work of Jesus Christ, not primarily politics. Liberation being made free happens first inside of someone. You know, we could go through, and I, I I started to go down the rabbit trail when I was reading this of all individuals like Nelson Mandela and so many others who, for a political reason, were imprisoned, and yet they talked about still being free in the midst of their imprisonment, right? Because it doesn't matter if you're imprisoned or under political issues when inside you've been made free, because you see what you're under is only temporary. You're willing to stand up for, speak for, and fight for, even in the political realm, when first you understand your liberation inside of you. Peter uses liberation or ransom as the lamb, the, the blood, as symbols of that atonement, that liberating us inside, the atonement of Jesus Christ. Atonement simply is at one meant. It's that changing. We are broken in our relationship. We cannot have a pure relationship with God, and yet through the blood of Jesus, we are made at one, so that relationship can be made whole again. And when we learn to have a better relationship with God, we learn to have a better relationship with others, right? All of our relationships made one again, redeemed, restored because of the ransoming work of Jesus Christ, the liberating work of Jesus Christ. Liberation for the audience that Peter was writing in this book, they realized it is liberation from the past, right? They had been in Egypt subject to slavery, and they were made free. They were rescued by the hand of God, not by anything they did to fight for it. They were rescued by the hand of God from the Egyptians. God ransomed them from slavery and not just the politics of Egypt. And now, though, they were seeking and starting to muddle this and begin to see it as, well, it was a political liberation from Rome. Remember, that's why so many of them have, they, they had, missed the point that Jesus was the Messiah because when he didn't set up an earthly kingdom right then and there, but he 
set up his heavenly kingdom, a spiritual kingdom by the coming of the Holy Spirit, they missed it. They, they missed it. They fought against it because they wanted a political one against Rome. Liberation had a price. It always has a price that has to be paid. And Jesus Christ paid the spiritual liberation for you and for I in full. He ransomed us. He bought us. You know, we hear a lot about that in the news lately, ransomware. You know, it's computers, our own um, hospital system here in uh, our county, Ashtabula County, Ohio, uh, a while back got caught on one of those ransomwares. And they call in, say, we want so much money. And if not, we're going to shut down your systems. And they did. They shut down the computer systems at a hospital. Now, we could go on and on about how desperate, how stupid, and how cruel those individuals had to be to shut down a computer system to a hospital. Okay, But that's not the point of our discussion here. This is a church spiritual discussion, right? Um, those are political matters we can go into at another time. But that ransom where, unless that ransom is paid, you are under the penalty. Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty, to ransom us back from Satan. Our sins had made us a slave to Satan, a slave to evil, and the punishment was death, physical death spiritual separation and death. We were living in death, this broken relationship with God. And Jesus Christ bought our debt. He paid our ransom and our the person was freed. We were freed. This is the work of salvation. Peter uses those examples, the lamb. You know, when, when you would talk to a Jewish individual about a lamb, it went back to the sacrifices. There were only a couple sacrifices that you would supply a perfect spotless lamb. One was the Passover, when death passed over them. Another one would have been at the sacrifice, the sin offering. So when the sin offering was made for all of Jerusalem, the priest would take two lambs, two spotless, without blemish lambs. And there would be some sort of a lot cast or something. One of these two lambs would be chosen. Hands would be laid on to transfer the sins of the people to this lamb. And that lamb would be set free. Grace given to the lamb, but yet separation from the rest. They were set out into the wilderness, sent away the scapegoat. And then the other lamb was sacrificed. That has been something that the Israelites had done for generations. One lamb set free into the wilderness, grace given to the one, sacrifice and the atonement for sin by the blood's blood of the second good morning pat we saw that even in what we are coming near to in the time of good friday jesus standing before the crowd actually two men standing before the crowd if you remember right one barabbas History actually tells us the early church says that his name was really Jesus Barabbas. And then Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus Bar Joseph, son of Joseph. That's what Barabbas meant. Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Messiah. These two standing before the people. One let go free. The scapegoat, the other one's blood shed for the sins of all people once and for all. It was a reminder of God's delivering act for us, his keeping us safe and keeping the people in Peter's day safe from death 
and his great act of delivering us from the punishment, death, the punishment of death at the Passover and punishment of death from our sins, the consequence, that separation, the death of relationship. The second picture given was the blood without blemish or defect. Blood was used to purify in the Israel for the uh, Israelites and for the priests. It was a purification offering. One of the biggest uh, uh, times we see that was in the purification of the priests to make them holy, to dedicate them. There was all kinds of rituals around that. You can look at that in the Old Testament. But one of it was taking the hyssop and sprinkling blood over them. The blood of the lamb that was sacrificed. We are a priesthood of believers. The blood of the lamb has been sprinkled over us, not in a temporary form, but in a permanent form for the cleansing effect of our sins. It cleanses the effect of the sins in our lives so that we can walk out in holiness. The unblemished lamb given to cover the sins of the blemished for a season in the Old Testament. Jesus, the unblemished, perfect lamb, the lamb of God, his blood covered us not just for a season, but for all eternity. His precious blood. His death on a tree that we often hear it called as being precious. Now, I don't know about you, but being crucified, there's nothing precious about that. Passion of the Christ made that real to us in a way that uh, modern movies never had. The pain, the suffering, the brutality of the torture of being crucified on a cross. There was nothing precious about that view. His taking on all the sins of all humanity it caused separation that God turned his face from him. It doesn't seem precious. But what he did on that cross to bring victory over sin. And by his death and resurrection to give us victory over death. To usher in his kingdom on earth. In the things of the world that we see as not precious. We see the true preciousness of God. Sin and its consequences are not the primary focus of the redemption. This liberation, it's not just the liberation from sin and its consequences. He didn't die to make you good enough. You know, every other religion in the world when you look at it, there's a story of C.S. Lewis walking into a room and they were debating all these different religions and what makes Christianity different from them. And they're debating, well, you know, all of this and it, it points out a moral good and a moral wrong and you got to meet up to this moral good and blah, 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 blah. And C.S. Lewis walked in a little late and he goes, what are you guys discussing? And they told him and he goes, oh, I can tell you the difference. It's grace. It's grace. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, making atonement for our sins so that you don't have to. It's grace. Being given what you don't deserve. It's grace. <laughs> That's the difference in Christianity from all other religions. In all other religions, you have to work to be good enough. It, um, the The... Far, I'm not going to say right or left or use any of those words that are sometimes buzzwords in, in our American culture, but the 
far end of the Islamic that say that you have to blow yourself up to earn your passage into uh, all, you know, eternity. You have to earn it. Other religions say you have to be good enough, right? Because if not, your karma will come to play out and you will be reincarnated as something bad. If you're good enough, you'll get reincarnated as something good. You have to earn it. You do not have to earn your salvation. In fact, guess what? You cannot earn your salvation. That's the liberation of Jesus Christ. It's the liberating that he does for us. You know, we could look at it in modern warfare. Ukraine needs liberating. In World War II, there were countries that needed liberated. The Jews needed liberated from the Holocaust. Liberating is stepping in and rescuing someone who cannot rescue themselves. Who without outside help will perish. In all humanity, we need that grace, that amazing grace, that rescue, that liberation. He didn't die to make you good enough. He died to make us whole and to be in that perfect relationship with God and with others. To fill the emptiness, the void of our inherited life. That inherited way of life that comes from that bent to sin. And because he has paid the ransom, he has wiped us clean, we no longer have to give in to sin. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't. We are human and we screw up time and time again. But yet we can find freedom. Those chains can be broken to sin and we can find ourselves focused not on us and working hard trying to be good enough and being condemned every time that we feel like we failed. Instead, when we focus on God, we find that our draw to sin is even less. Because our draw and our focus is on a Savior. We hear the words of those songs like the youth sang for us on Sunday, and they sang again last night, and it's still stuck in my head. Come now, my soul. Don't you grow quiet now. Lift up your voice because you've got a lion inside of your lungs. Let's come on and praise the Lord. We are called to praise him, to focus on him. Jesus died to liberate us from the bondage and desires of our old life. His grace that is sufficient. His grace that is enough when you're not enough. His grace that's enough to help you overcome the draw to sin and the temptations in your lives. His grace is enough. That's what the other religions do not have to offer. They don't have grace. Have you tasted his grace? Taste and see that I am God. The scroll was given to Isaiah, right? And it tasted like honey, sweet honey. Taste and see that God is good. His grace is sufficient even for me. May we learn to understand the grace that liberates us, changes us inside so that we are made different, different than the world, outside and corporately. That we would walk out in holiness into our jobs, into our families, into the world around us, and that they would see Jesus shining through you and through me. 
simply saying and telling them, can I tell you what God has done for me? Can I tell you what God has done in my life? You know, it sounds like you're beating yourself up quite a bit. You know, I used to do that all the time. But then I realized that Jesus Christ came and paid those con the penalties. I might live with the consequence of some of my sins yet, but hey, God is sufficient. His grace is helping me in those struggles. And we're able to speak that to those around us. To share the story of what God has done. So God, I pray that we would in these days leading up to Easter. That we don't rush over the sacrifice of your torture, your beatings, your betrayal, and the forgiveness you found even in the midst of it. That on the cross, your focus was not in condemning others, because you could have. Your focus is on crying out, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. Lord, help us to see those that hurt us, who make fun of us, who ridicule us for our beliefs, that we understand that they just need to understand the grace of God. That they don't understand what they do. Lord, help us to be strong. Help us to taste and see this grace that has liberated us. When we could not save ourselves, you stepped in and made the permanent sacrifice. Every day, Lord, may we live in that, realizing you've given us the grace to overcome those choice sins in our lives, that grace to be a different person, that grace to change our personality. We no longer have to be mean and rude. We no longer have to be judgmental. We can be ambassadors of your grace. And we truly understand how amazing it was to save a wretch like me. We once were lost, but now we've been found. Found, ransomed, liberated, and made free by your precious blood, the perfect Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. Thank you for not giving up on us. May we not give up on the world around us. For your namesake and for your glory, help us to continue to usher your kingdom in throughout the world. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. We'll go in peace and I pray that you have a wonderful rest of the day and enjoy some beautiful warm weather.